as we approach the end of the course, um, I always ask this question. I, I haven't got the figures in front of me, but is there anyone who uh, has not missed any classes? Has that, have one of you been to all classes? I suspect everyone's got. Seda, you've, you've been to all of them? So if I check the records, it'll be there. Normally, if someone has been to every single class, maybe not, add drop period, obviously, the first, the first class or so, it doesn't count. But if ever someone's been to all the classes, then I give an extra bonus point. Okay? So that means you've got to keep coming for the next two weeks or however long we've got. Um, uh, Senna, of course, you're in a special situation because you have permission, but I can always check with Fikret Hodger, and then if you've been going to his and to mine, then we can always do the extra bonus for you as well, I don't know. But uh, the rest of you, uh, even one absence means that you can still get your full points for attendance, but you won't get the extra one which I give, so uh, we'll see about that. Okay, um, we'll make a start, one or two people may come in, but we may as well start off. We've got quite a few things to get through. Um, Firstly, sign. So I know you're here today, of course. Were you all here on Wednesday? Do you all have the bibliography and the information for this topic? Each of those of you? So you don't have this? Right, so you haven't seen. Okay, so I'll just briefly... This is the next... Uh, you, uh, I, sorry? Yeah, yeah, I'll change that. That's just a printed thing. Oh, you change it. Put, put the, is it the ninth today? Put the ninth. So for our last topic, I'll just briefly explain for the guys. Uh, we're looking at four monotheistic religions which have emerged or begun in the past 500 years or so. Monotheism means what? Monotheistic. No, no, I'm asking these guys. You were all here. You were all here. You were listening. I'm asking these guys now. But uh, monotheism means one God. Yeah, yeah, well done. Um, which obviously is the most important and kind of popular form of religious belief today in the world. Um, and obviously we think of Christianity and Islam and Judaism to some extent as the big religions in the world, particularly the first two. What we're looking at are four religions which believe in one God in one way or another, uh, or can be described as monotheistic, uh, which have appeared more recently, okay, later than uh, the big famous ones that dominate the world. And we're going to look at their ideas and where they've come from and how they're connected to the other religions and things like that. For this topic, um, there is nothing relevant in the textbook. Uh, and what I decided to do is to have kind of 100% completely come in, uh, come in to have completely electronic online resources. Uh, for their holy books and other things. Everything is put there online. So uh, it's got the URLs here, but you don't need to sit there and type all these things out because you always make a mistake. Just go to the uh, page for uh, this topic, and then, as you will see, the links are all there. Okay, And they should all be working. I checked them a while back, and so on. Okay, So it tells you the name of the holy book, the name of the writing you have to read, then it points you to the particular parts you must look at. This is the link. And then to understand it more clearly, you will listen to me today and next week. But also then you will look at the website for these religions. In some cases it's the official website for that religion, not in all of them. And then I've also given the Wikipedia page, Wikipedia page, which I know lots of teachers say, you shouldn't use Wikipedia, but it's a useful summary of their ideas. So in my opinion, it's not such a bad thing. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, um, this, this is the international website of the Baha'i people. Okay, this is their proper one. I think the Mormon one is the same as well. They have a number of websites, but this is the official information, it says, it says there. Okay, so I know, well, let's click on that and have a look. Sikhism is not so centralized, you see. So the Sikh, it's just a web page created by 
some Sikhs somewhere. Okay, well that's a bit of an odd thing, wasn't it? Okay. Um, but this is the church that, you know, these, this is a formal hierarchical religion based in Salt Lake City in Utah State. And it has a president who is a prophet. And so this is their website, okay? Just as I never looked at it, but I'm sure the Pope has a website. I'm sure if we found the Vatican probably has a website, okay? Fair enough, everyone has one today. Um, so it just depends on what, sorry? Jesus, way over there, he doesn't, yeah, they, they, they might get into trouble there because then the Protestants will say, no, but we believe in Jesus, you can't have that, you, you can't have that uh, address for yours. So the Sikhs don't have a proper website because it's more decentralized now. The holy book is the authority, there's no man who's the top of it. The Mormons do in fact have a, a website, the Baha'is do and Rastafarians don't, so half of these do. Okay. But for... Uh, Yaz and Ferhat, the point is this little paragraph at the end. When looking at these websites, these are okay. Selection for reading, holy book. This is just their holy book. It's the stuff that, they've, uh, that they believe in. Looking at these especially, Wikipedia is just, well, is it reliable or not? But looking at these websites, they are either the official website of that religion or they are websites created by believers of that religion. So they are not, I wouldn't, people might object to this, but what we're saying is they're not totally objective. Okay? They are trying to promote, trying to sell their religion to the world. That's what the website is there for, in a sense. Everyone who believes something would like everyone else to believe that. Okay? I mean, in a sense, in a little or in a big way. I mean, you're all democratic. You believe in democracy and republican values and things like that, and everyone should be allowed to have the vote, yes? And you would think the world would be a better place if everyone in the world lived according to those ideas. Now they don't, and there are many people who would disagree with you or whatever. So what do you do? I mean, even by saying that, you are, in a sense, trying to promote your belief uh, to other people or whatever. I mean, I, you know, I, I like to listen to 1970s rock music, and I think the world would be a happier place if everyone else listened to guitar-based rock music. But I'm not going to force that on you or whatever, but I might make a website to promote that idea or something. But this is obviously rather more serious. This is something where they believe there is the truth. There is the truth about everything because of the God, and so everyone should be part of their religion. All religions have converted people to them or have conquered them. Very few religions don't try and spread their ideas for one reason or another. Some are like that, but most believe if they have the truth, then the world would be better if everyone was part of that. So in a way, that's what they're doing. So when you read these pages, what I'm saying is you have to kind of be careful. Decat, okay, exclamation mark, because this is their belief, this is what they're trying to do. It's not just information, though a lot of it is. So as you read it, be careful how you interpret, how you use the, the statements and things like that. Okay. So, either for you two or anyone else who was here on Wednesday, are there any questions? Anything? We're all clear about this? Okay, let's carry on then. We Already it's 5 to 11, tempers fugit, as the Romans would say. Let's very briefly <coughs> remind ourselves what we're looking at. So, okay, here is an image, God and Adam and so on, we won't worry about that. Um, we started by defining monotheism, okay? most importantly as we just said, it's the belief that there is one God, one supernatural, super powerful, all powerful, all knowing, spiritual being normally, uh, who is the creator and the source of everything and all these things. The different religions will have a different emphasis, a different idea of uh, what this God is uh, or was or whatever. Um, but for us here, the fundamental idea is somehow there is this one God, and there are lots of similarities. Monotheistic religions in general are what we call revealed religions. That means that God, or an angel of God, has revealed, has shown the truth to a prophet, a person, or persons it could be, I suppose. So the idea of revelation here is giving the ideas to people. And this truth is normally preserved in book or books. We call them the holy books or the scriptures. Okay. Today I've brought along my copy of the Book of Mormon. Okay. I happen, I'm not a Mormon myself, I don't go to bed and read this or something, but I'm an interested historian. So a number of years ago for 
a second-hand copy, so it's probably quite cheap, I can't remember now, but uh, for whatever it was, I bought this copy of the Book of Mormon, and I've used it and read it and looked at it and so on, things like that. So there is the Holy Book, which contains part of the truth as believed by members of the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, for example. So, one God, the religious truth is revealed from God or an intermediary, someone in the middle, an angel, to a prophet, an important person, and then we have that truth in holy book, in a holy book which is perceived to be the truth. Then we discuss this big problem, okay, can we study these religions historically? If history is about people, and it's about documents written by people, and we understand the past by reading these things, then if you believe in the Mormon faith, this is something more than that. It contains the truth according to God. It's a little bit different in this case because they say that these ancient Amerindians put it together. But in the case of Islam, we said you have the Quran. That's the word of God come down uh, to the Prophet Muhammad. So it's not, in that sense, the same as this, which is David's syllabus written by David. It's different. So how can we study these things? We will always have some disagreements, some conflicts between historians on the one hand and believers of the religion on the other, we said. And then we've started looking at the Sikh religion first. We're about halfway through that. For you two who are not here, the Sikhs come from northwest India, a region in India called the Punjab. Okay? Most of them still live in uh, India. Not, n none of them, I think, they all left the part what is now Pakistan uh, after uh, the creation of India and Pakistan. Um, their religion is influenced both by Hinduism Indian, one of the big Indian religions, but also by Islam. It's a kind of mixture of them, but not literally. And it's also reacting against some of the ideas of uh, that religion. Their founder is this guy, Guru Nanak, who is here. Okay. And they say he was the first of ten gurus. There were nine people who came after him as leaders of their religion. He was the first one. Okay. Uh, and then at the end, when the last of these guys died, they don't have a leader anymore. They just believe in their book, the holy book, the Guru Granth Sahib. Okay. And so they don't have a, a president or a boss or a pope or anything like that. They just have the book, so they're more decentralized. Okay. Then we were looking at uh, the development of that book. It went through a number of stages. We don't need to repeat that. The final one was created at the beginning of the 18th century. They lost it about 50 years later, but then they had copies, which is what they use uh, today. And finally, we were here looking at what they believe. We've just started looking at that, and by looking at the Mool Mantra here, we were understanding their conception of monotheism. There is one God, okay, at the start, very important. Eternal truth is his name. So he's eternal, lives forever, and he's the truth. Creator of all things, so the creator of everything, all-pervading spirit. He's a spirit, okay, not a body, and all-pervading means he knows everything. He's everywhere, all-powerful. Fearless and without hatred, he doesn't have emotions like people have, or it. Timeless and formless, okay, there is no control. It doesn't have a beginning and an end, beyond birth and death, you see next. Formless, doesn't have a body, okay, self-enlightened, it knows because of itself, and through the grace of the guru, through the grace of uh, Guru Nanak, or the Guru Granth Sahib, or whatever he is known. We come to truth through the Gurus. Okay. That's where we got up to, I think, last time. So let's resume that now. Okay. Any questions before we carry on then? Either from you two who are not here, because I've given you a very kind of quick version of that. Uh, or anyone else, any questions about where anything? Well, yeah, I mean, the word guru means the one that brings us from darkness into light, an enlightener. And originally, all the first ten gurus were people, okay? They were teachers in that sense, enlighteners. Guru Nanak was the first, the most important in a, in a sense. But once they said, okay, no more human leaders, then their holy book is called the Guru Granth Sahib, okay? So it is the thing now which takes people to light in that sense. So you, I think they apply the word equally to human being and to the holy book because it's the thing which enlightens us, which teaches us the truth, the light. Okay. Okay, let's go through some of their other 
important ideas and beliefs which will help us understand a little bit more about uh, where they're coming from and so on. Okay. It's very common in many religions, especially in monotheistic religions, to give human beings a special place. Okay. In some of the polytheistic ancient religions, in fact, human beings are seen as kind of negative and bad, but they are still treated a little bit separately from the rest of nature, other animals, and so on. Because we're ourselves, the humans, we naturally want to see ourselves as somehow a little bit special or whatever, I suppose. I don't know the site, there must be a whole research, the psychology of, of religious ideas and so on. But um, Sikhs, like other religions, believe that human beings are special, okay, that they have a special place. They're not the same as other animals uh, in creation. They have a special role uh, and role to play. And here, the important concept is that we have a special unity with God. Ultimately, if we didn't do certain things which we do, we would actually be part of God, in a sense, part of that whole thing. We have a, a special connection to that, okay. And We are dependent on God. We depend on God for ourselves and our well-being. So, so unity and dependence. Okay. So there is a special relationship between humans in creation and God. Okay. We, are, we have a connection to him. We are, in a sense, part of, of God's uh, element in the universe. And we depend on him. We are, he is above us in that sense. But... Unfortunately, most people don't realize that. Most people don't feel or understand these things. Okay? And therefore, we live our lives in a more dual way. Okay? So we see ourselves, there's God and there's us. Whereas what they're saying is really there's unity. We're all part of the same thing with God. We're part of, of God. But on a normal day, when we lead our lives, when we come to classes, when we go to work or whatever it is, we're behaving more in a dualistic way. We don't appreciate this connection that we have with God. Okay? We see ourselves as somehow separate, physically and spiritually separate from, from, uh, from God. Okay? And this is the concepts of Maya and Humai, which exists in their religion. Maya is... What's how we can... Uh, Maya means that when we behave, we behave in a kind of materialistic way. Now, it doesn't mean that we're kind of bad and we just want things all the time ourselves. We want to, I want, oh, that a lovely watch, I'm going to steal his watch or something like that. Uh, it's not in a negative way, though it is negative for them, of course. It just means day by day we live a physical life. Okay? We are focusing on physical things, whatever they may be. And temporal here means time. We're fixed in time. We, we live according to what is going on now. So instead of being realizing that we're in fact kind of part of God, with God, unified with God, we are behaving in a less spiritual way in our lives, okay? which is what we all do. Okay? And they're saying this is kind of wrong, but they're not emphasizing the negative things. It's not just being deliberately uh, evil or bad or something like that. It's just, it's an inevitable product of not connecting, uh, realizing this thing. Okay? And Humai is self-reliance. So instead of appreciating that we are dependent of God, we need God, we are behaving more independently okay, than we should do. We, we behave in, a, in an independent manner. So, instead of being unified with God, being part of God in a spiritual way, and being dependent on God, human beings, most human beings, day to day, uh, act according to these ideas, Maya and Humai. We, are, we feel independent from God, we feel separate from God, 
and we live in the physical, material kind of world. Okay? And we can be extreme materialists or, or not, but that's the, the reality of most of us. And most of what the Sikhs believe is that our attempt to escape from that situation gradually uh, to become uh, unified with God, to be liberated, to be freed, and finally to uh, reach up to God. And I think we can see a lot of Indian influences here in Hinduism and all that, the ideas of, of working up through stages and, and achieving some kind of special spiritual enlightenment and so on. This is particularly coming from, from that situation. Okay. Um, like many Eastern religions, the Sikhs have a concept of rebirth or reincarnation is another word for that one. Okay, this is something that we don't have in Islam or whatever. Uh, so this is coming from the Indian side into their religion. Okay. So because of these things, because of the materialism, Maya, and our self-reliance, our independence, Humai, uh, we are not escaping from the physical life and becoming part of God. So when we die, we are born again. Okay? Our spirit or soul or whatever it is is put into a new body. Okay? And we carry on like that, and it's a cycle that carries on going on until through our actions and to our appreciation and understanding of this, some people can escape from this continuous cycle of rebirth, physical rebirth, and can become fully part of God as they actually are. Okay? But it takes time and so on. And their word for this is samsara, okay, for this rebirth process and so on. So what do we want? We want to be liberated, we want to be freed from these ideas and we want to achieve liberation, freedom, mukti as they call it, okay, that's the, uh, that's the ultimate aim of all these things. So we try and be less materialistic, we try and give less importance to the physical life. And we try and contemplate God, we try and meditate God to communicate with God. This is the beginning, the first process of this. And this is very important, we'll come back to this later on, but this materialism is important on a number of levels. Because what they're saying is wanting something Oh, no, your pen, uh, your watch. Okay, wanting this watch is obviously materialistic. I want a nice watch, and everyone will think, "Oh, look at his nice watch," or something. That is giving importance to material things. But also, many other religions say you can become good by rejecting physical things. Okay, by saying, "I won't have property." Okay, or by saying, "I won't get married and have." sexual relationships with a woman or whatever, that's a physical experience as well. And having children and things, I'll just go away and think about God and not eat much food and things. They say that's also giving importance to the material world by rejecting it. By just saying, I don't want that, okay, you're still actually giving it importance. You've got to get beyond the wanting and not wanting to the next level up, I suppose, is how you would say it. So whereas in Christianity and Islam and others, they have all sorts of rules about how you can be a better person by not doing this and not wanting that. By having that rule, you're just still focusing on those things, and we've got to get beyond that way of looking at things. Sorry? Well, that's, we'll say a little bit about that now, but I don't, I mean, obviously I don't really fully understand it because I'm a material kind of a person, I suppose, or whatever, I don't know. But, um, so in an ordinary life, we live, we should live an ordinary life. We shouldn't want too much of things, and there are certain things like alcohol that we shouldn't drink, we'll come to that later on, but uh, also we are here, we should recognize we've got a physical life, and we should live an ordinary physical life, but within that move up through a number of levels of stages of kind of consciousness, awareness, to finally reach liberation in that sense, okay. So we go through a number of stages, okay, what have I got here? Um, we try to become God-conscious and God-filled. So let's put those words here. Okay, and the word here is Gulbukh, I think. And then we can achieve this liberation, this mukti, okay, from the cycle. And we can do some of it 
ourselves. Okay, some of this process we can do ourselves. Devotion. Okay, believing the truth, praying, thinking about God, and things like that. Okay, being a a um, uh, a good believer in that sense. Okay, and if you do that, you will achieve knowledge. Okay, you will then achieve more knowledge of uh, these things. When you have knowledge, when you understand a bit more, you will then try and work even harder because you have some knowledge. You will use that knowledge. You will use effort to move beyond these things. All of this humans can do themselves, living an ordinary life, not rejecting things, just living an ordinary kind of life in general. Okay, Through religious worship and prayer and thinking and meditation, you achieve a certain amount of knowledge that we can achieve, then you work hard with that knowledge. Afterwards, to get final liberation, we need help from God. We need God's grace. God will help us through the last stages. Okay. So then, God will then step in at a certain point, so to speak, and work with people, uh, not so consciously. And through God's grace, finally, people will achieve complete truth, full understanding of what the world is, and then they will not be reborn, then they will be liberated from things. Okay. And as I said, a lot of this stuff probably is influenced by the more oriental Hindu Indian traditions of, uh, of an understanding of the world and so on. Okay, any questions there? That all clear? that one of course. Okay, let's say a bit about their ordinary kind of their ordinary lives and their religious life uh, on a more daily basis and so on. Well, we said devotion, worshipping is very important, okay? Praying, communicating with God in one way or another, a uh, very very important aspect of their uh, life. Um, They worship, like many religions, both personally, they must individually be praying to God, contemplating God, meditating uh, the truth, or trying to think about that. But also, they will also worship communally. They will sometimes get together with other people, and they will think about God and work on these things with other people. Okay, so it's both a personal thing that you must do, but also it's a communal thing. The communal praying, happens in buildings like this, which is called a Gurdwara, and it's the kind of Sikh temple. Okay. They're equivalent, but not exactly the same, as a mosque in Islam, or a church in Christianity, um, or a synagogue for the Jews. Okay. It's the particular place uh, for them, where you can get together with others. Now, the difference is that any building can become a Gurdwara. Okay, this is a nice fine one, presumably somewhere in the Punjab in India uh, today. Uh, any building can become one. It has to contain the holy book. Guru Granth Sahib has to be in there. Okay. You have to have a copy of their holy book uh, in the building. Normally, they will have some kind of flag. They have their orange flag, and this is probably the flagpole. It's cut off. There's a flag up there, okay, to mark it out. And in many situations, I think they will, if they can, they will paint the building white. They will make it a white building, okay. But otherwise, there's nothing special about this, okay. You have the flag, you have maybe white. The most important thing is you have a copy of the book in there, and people know they can go there. They don't have a special day for worshipping. There is no Juma or Sunday or Sabbath or whatever. They don't have a special day where on that day definitely you have to go to the mosque or you have to go to uh, the church or something like that. They don't have a special time. Like in Islam, okay, you go at certain times in the day to the mosque or you pray on your own if you uh, don't have a mosque available or you put your thing down. There's no fixed times. Okay? Or again, in Christianity on Sunday, people know everyone goes to the church on t at 10 o'clock. It varies in different places, but there is a time where you know everyone will be there. So there's no day and there's no time. So a Sikh can go into a 
uh, Gurdwara at any time during the day if it's open, and we'll just join in what's going on. Okay. They also don't have a, a kind of priest or imam. There's no one whose special job is to control or lead or guide everyone else. Okay, there is no special guy in that sense. They have someone who is sometimes called a granthi, but his job is just to sing or recite parts of the Guru Granth Sahib. He's a normal person, but when he goes there, maybe because he's got a good voice or he feels more confident, I'm not very really sure, or he's had some training, his job is to sit there and then just read out parts of the holy book to everyone else to listen to and they might join in and things like that. So he's not really a priest or someone. He doesn't have a special role uh, in terms of dealing with other people in other ways. So it's all quite decentralized in that sense, okay? It's not all focused and so on. So normally what they do, they go in any time, they'll take their shoes off, presumably, I don't know what Hindus do, but that sounds more Islamic, of course, to me, and normally men and women will be sitting in separate parts of the uh, Gurudwara, I think, as well. And then they'll just join in what's going on. They'll be uh, joining in the singing or the poems from the Guru Granth Sahib and other things that they'll be hearing. And by doing this, by doing this kirtan, singing and so on, they will be thinking about God, but doing it with other people rather than on their own. Okay? And then I guess they can leave at any point that they need to as well. So that's uh, the communal worship in the Gurdwara, okay, which will also focus, it will be a social center and they'll have a focus for meeting and things like that. It has other f uh, sort of unofficial things, but in terms of formal religious worship, I think the main things are described here. Okay, there are uh, five symbols, things, which are associated with Sikhs and purely by chance they end up having the letter K in the way we spell them in modern English. Uh, the five Ks, which I think all or most of them are here. Okay, so let's open this one up and talk a little about it. some of these. Okay. These again are, I suspect, more to do with symbolic identity uh, rather than kind of a formal religious thing, because they're physical things, so they're not giving importance to this again. It's just something as part, it's developed, emerged as part of their uh, identity. Most importantly, remember we talked about the long hair that they have. They don't cut their hair, okay? And men wear it with the turban, they have to wrap the hair up on top of their head in this special knot which is called Kesh, and then you wear the turban over. And as we were saying, the turban, uh, the turban is not a religious thing, therefore. It's more a sort of identity symbolic thing. Okay? It says, I am a Sikh, but it's not something that they'll perhaps get uh, too worked up about in a religious way. Okay? And obviously in Turkey, the issues of turban are very important these days. So it's a bit different, I think, for them. Okay? The main thing is it helps them to look after the hair. It's the hair which is more important. And they're not necessarily trying to hide it from other people. They're just trying to make it more practical and preserve their hair. Okay? Kirpan is this kind of long knife or sword which Sikh men are meant to carry around because they're kind of, you know, it's uh, uh, representing their kind of manliness or something, I suppose. And of course, that does cause trouble. Uh, I know in parts of, I mean, not only in Turkey, but in other countries in the world, the Muslim turbans cause problem. Uh, not just the men, but the women, but the men, but particularly the women. In France and other where, countries, they, they have laws against wearing your turban and so on. Uh, and you could say, well, why? It's all to do with this or that. Uh, in other countries, of course, Sikhs cannot walk around with a big sword down the streets. It's not a good idea. So I think that has caused occasional problems uh, uh, with local authorities. They'll say, you can't carry a sword around. No one can walk around with a dangerous weapon and things like that. So, um, but I presume that they, they can understand that. They don't cause a big problem with that. And then they have uh, this little bracelet, a bangle it's called there, 
and the special comb they use for their hair. I'm not sure about those. The, uh, the funny thing, the funniest one is the special pair of uh, shorts, trousers, boxer shorts almost, which they wear underneath or whatever, okay, which is meant to somehow symbolize their moral behavior and their self-control and, and things like that, okay. So these are the five Ks, which are partly kind of religious, but more to do with identity and to do with personal uh, behavior and identity in that sense. Okay. And they are things which uh, help us identify the Sikhs. And let's finish off the Sikhs by looking at uh, their personal behavior, their day-to-day -day behavior. We've only got 10 minutes, so we'll probably finish this after the break, okay. There is a written document called the Recht Mariada, the Code of Conduct, okay. And this word actually, if you look at it carefully, it's probably related to the English word right, okay. okay it's, it's a cognate, you can see very similar uh, there in that sense, okay. And this controls or gives some guidance to their physical and their spiritual behavior. Okay. It's a guidelines for how they should behave, how they should behave in themselves, but also how they should behave towards other people. Okay. There are some rules and so on. Diet, dietary, what does that refer to? Eating habits, okay, in that sense. So many religions have got dietary rules, okay, halal, kosher in uh, Islam and uh, Christianity, forbidding you to drink certain things or whatever, okay. In general, the Sikhs are less concerned with this kind of thing than other religions might be. For example, in general, they're not bothered about Fasting. Fasting, what does that mean? It doesn't mean sort of running very quickly, being fast. It's something that you do in Islam once a year. Yes, you're not eating in some way for, I mean, uh, in Islam, you don't eat throughout the day, okay, for that period of time. In Christianity, for example, in the weeks building up to Easter, many Christians will say, I'll have one less meal. Okay, or I'll not eat something which I like very much. Okay, I'm giving up chocolate for Lent, is what they would say. And they won't have their favorite food until it gets to Easter and things like that. Now, for a Sikh, what the Muslims do, what the Christians do, is just another instance of maya. Okay, as we said before. Because you spend a large part of the day feeling bloody hungry. Okay? And, um, so you're thinking about the physical thing, and you're saying, oh, I'm being a good religious boy, but you're still thinking about the physical side. So they're saying, don't do that kind of thing, okay? That's not, that's just wasting time. You're still focusing and thinking about and giving importance too much to the physical one, even if you're not eating, or over don't eat too much food, but don't go around not eating enough food either. Just eat a balanced diet to keep yourself healthy every day, okay? That's fine, they say. They do say no alcohol, because it makes you behave in a strange way. The same with tobacco. So obviously most of my Turkish friends couldn't become Sikhs because they smoke anyway. And obviously drugs, LSD or whatever, things like that. Things which affect your behavior and obviously things which you become addicted to. Okay, whether it's alcohol addiction or nicotine addiction in cigarettes and things like that. Things which control your physical and therefore your emotional life. They say we can't have those. So those are the things that they do ban. Okay, and they're not natural. We don't need alcohol, we can drink water, we don't need cigarettes, we can breathe air, okay, but food in a balanced way we do need, so we're not going to control that. Now some Sikhs are in fact vegetarians, um, which might sound contradictory, but most of them I don't think are, and I think this is the influence of Hinduism, okay, because in India there is a very strong vegetarian tradition in Hindu religion and other faiths and things like that. So we put a bracket around that, that's not really a religious thing, it's a cultural thing. It's influenced by where they're, where they're coming from in that sense. So in addition to just eating normally throughout the year, okay, eating normal food, having a balanced diet, people should also have a normal family 
life. Okay? All Sikhs should have a normal family life. So, for example, in many religions, Hinduism is one example of this, or Christianity I'm more familiar with, in the, what's one of the notable things about a Catholic priest? Protestant uh, vicars, they call them priests. In the Protestant form of Christianity, it doesn't happen. But for Catholics, what's the special thing about a Catholic priest which makes him different from other people? You can't marry, you can't have children. Okay? You're supposed to be what we call in English, celibate. Okay? You don't have a physical relationship with a member of the, well, with any person in that sense, sexual relationship. Okay? You focus your life on God and your duty to God and to other people through for God and so on. And Catholic priests are celibate. In Protestantism, they can get married if they want to and have families and things like that. But, uh, and other religions also have special holy people who don't have a physical relationship with someone else. And they say no. Okay. By doing that, it's the same as fasting. You're just giving importance to that side of the human physical life. You should just get on and have an ordinary life and have children and a wife and a husband, whatever it is, and don't become, they would then perhaps reject certain aspects of modern relationships which we accept these days. I'm not really sure where they stand on all those things, but all Sikhs should just be get married and have children and things like that. Okay. Again, culturally, in India, Many marriages are assisted okay, or arranged. It means it's not two young people that love each other and want to get married and things. The fathers of the family will say, well, we've been good friends for a long time and I think my son might be able to marry your daughter. And you say, that sounds like a good idea. And then they, the light, the doors open. Uh, and then they fix all that up. Okay? And again, I don't think this is a formal thing. It's just this is what's very common in in that part of the world and so on. Okay. So marriage and family life, very important. Okay. What else have I got written down here? Uh, many other aspects of what they would call rituals, things that people do for religious reasons on a regular basis, they also reject. So for example, pilgrimage, hajj going to a special place and then feeling that somehow you've got a special relationship with God. That's again another Maya thing in that sense. Uh, what they call idol worship, focusing on physical things as a focus for your worshipping. You might say the cross in a Christian church, but also in Hinduism they have lots of images of their gods. They don't want that either. Okay? You, can't, you can't draw or represent God. So let's not even try, okay? So they don't focus on a, an image or a physical thing uh, for their worship and things like that. It's got to be something in here. So those aspects of life are also, um, uh, religious life are also not used. And lastly, I've got written down here, in general, General, but not absolutely, Sikhs prefer cremation. Do you know what that is? To cremate someone? So yeah, when you, when you die, okay, we've got a number of options. Well, we can just leave your body there, that's one option. But normally we don't do that, obviously. Um, most commonly, we inter people, we bury them under the ground, okay, which is what often happens in Islam and Christian traditions. But uh, further east, cremation, is also quite common. Okay. They do it a lot in England today as well because it saves space, I suppose. So, um, and in Hinduism, cremation is important. So I think they've got that idea from them. But some Sikhs can be buried under the ground. So it's a general thing, but it's not a, an absolute 100% rule. Okay. Again, it's just a cultural influence from where they're coming from and so on. Okay, so that's the Sikhs. And if I remember correctly, uh, Emre, who's not here, and Asena will be and discussing and telling us more about their ideas and their holy book uh, right at the end of the course in about just under two weeks' time. Um, before we have our break, any questions? Anyone, anything you want to ask about these guys? I hope we can see uh, the different traditions feeding in. You can definitely see some things which are very similar 
to the Islamic beliefs, I hope, okay, particularly the monotheism and things like that. We've definitely seen the influences of Indian religious traditions fitting in, and then we can see something perhaps new as well. Okay? And as an historian, I'm always interested in the connections and what leads to something else. If I were a Sikh, of course, I would say, well, all that's, the rest of it's not true. This is the truth. So again, we have to look at it from different perspectives, of course. And if you ever see if you ever travel abroad, you won't see many Sikhs, I suppose, in Turkey, but if you ever travel abroad and you see guys with those beards and that kind of turban, you'll think, oh, okay, I remember from David's funny lecture the other year, that's, he's probably a Sikh, and you'll probably not see a sword there, I hope, depending on where you are. Okay, after the break, we shall start looking at the Mormons. We shall start looking at what, the, uh, uh, what Joseph Smith Jr. and uh, his church believe. Okay, and we'll do a similar thing. We'll go through similar stages of analyzing their history and their ideas. Okay, good. Right. See you all in 10 minutes.